Hello, uh, good afternoon here in, uh, in Lausanne. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this new installment of the Mixed Gen series, where we uh, want to, to bring together uh, young or researchers in their early stages, uh, together with more experienced researchers so that there are the possibility for an informal exchange and communication uh, and do that, doing that online. We're still uh, suffering uh, to a lesser extent, but still suffering the effects of, of the pandemics. And uh, we thought that this is a, a good environment to facilitate that interaction. And we do that by selecting a relatively generic topics. And uh, as you know, we have, uh, as you probably know, we have this first part of the event where we have three presentations and in this Zoom, uh, environment and then there is the second part which we move to a gather room where then there are the the, the the posters that we have received from some of you and then that room offers the possibility for poster presenters to present their results and then for all of you to be there and to interact through the posters or through the other attendees as we are used to do in in the poster session so that will hopefully facilitate the, the exchange among uh, all these people in different stages in their careers with this focus on early stage researchers. Today's uh, topic is uh, simulating biological systems. That's a huge area, as you can imagine, but then the idea is at least to touch some aspects that are relevant and also to attract people with uh, different uh, projects, different backgrounds and, and facilitate that exchange. So today, I mean, in, in this first part, we always invite a more experienced researcher. Today, it's a pleasure to have with us Benoit Roux from the University of Chicago. And then we'll have the, uh, the additional two talks by Beatriz Pinello and Samyak Mukherjee. Before we really move into the science, uh, being online, uh, even if we are by now more used to it, it's good to at least uh, remember you a bit of the etiquette of uh, uh, the event for today. So, uh, first of all, the I think the slide is like this. Now it's okay. Yes. So the the event is recorded, so that then afterwards it's available on the YouTube, the Seacam YouTube channel. Actually, you can also check the previous installments of this mixed gen series. They are all there. Um, regarding the interaction, as you know, at Seacam we pretty much always try to foster scientific interaction as much as possible. Uh, being online in itself, it's, it's a challenge. So in order to facilitate that, mm, there, there is ample time devoted to questions and answers so that there can be a dialogue. In the first presentation by uh, Benoit, because it's longer, uh, I will accept questions during his presentation. In this case, you have to write down your questions in the Q&A channel. And then I will relay them to, to Benoit to facilitate the, the flow of the presentation. And then when, when he finishes, then we have a specific part devoted to taking questions from you. And then there, you don't need to write down the question in the Q&A. You simply indicate with a hand or with a word that you want to ask a question. And then we will open your mic so that then I can give you the word and you can directly talk or make the, the, the question. And that also, depending on how the question evolves, the answer that also facilitates that there is a more of a dialogue between you and the presenter. Uh, once we finish with Benoit, we'll have the other two presentations because they are shorter for these two additional presentations. I will not take questions during the presentations. We will do the Q&A in the same way. You indicate you want to ask the question and then uh, we open your, the mic and you can actually interact directly with the presenter. Um, you will not be able to activate the video or the sound, so all the interaction is channeled through the Q&A. We, we think that this uh, facilitates uh, that a more focused interaction uh, still being as, as lively as possible. Now, uh, sorry, before we move on, also I wanted to, to 
additional pieces of information uh, every month on different topics. You can, if you go to the CCAM website, you can see the, the coming ones for, for this season. Actually, the next one will be at the end of April 28th. Uh, there will be a session on simulating uh, non equilibrium phenomena and rare events. And our experienced speaker in this case will be uh, Professor Tanya Schilling from the University of Freiburg. So again, you can also enroll into that if you think it is interesting. And actually, um, you can also register to our webinars mailing list in, as is indicated in the bottom of the, the web page of, of the CCAM. And then that also allows you to uh, get this information regularly as we organize these events. We, we also organize another type of uh, periodic online events. Uh, that's what we call the Marianne Mansai conversation series here. We, we aim at addressing aspects that are more related to the societal impact of modeling and computation. And the next uh, invited, the next event will be on May 5th in the afternoon, European time. And the invited speaker in this case is Eric Beamer, who is uh, one of the pioneers in the uh, uh, exploitation of modeling for industrial applications and in the interaction between modeling and industry. And I'm sure that will give rise to a very uh, lively uh, dialogue and, and open discussions as well. So you're also invited to attend if you find it interesting. And again, that's something that you can find on our webpage, or if you register, uh, then you will uh, receive it, uh, regularly. So after uh, this uh, short presentation, now we move on to the to the scientific uh, lectures, the scientific talks, and. Uh, the first one will be given by Benoit Roux from the University of Chicago. So please, Benoit, the floor now is yours. Yes, so uh, I, wish, I wish to uh, uh, acknowledge the CCAM for uh, organizing this series of workshop. Um, the CCAM is a, absolutely an outstanding uh organization and i am oops sorry i'm i'm really thrilled to participate and i think it does a great work and great service to the scientific community so so today uh i want to go quickly over oh i should just mention you know a lot of the work that was done uh, that i will describe here was was carried out by many talented postdoc and student jing li yiling meng fabian paul Trader Thomas, Avisek Das, uh, Jonathan Thierman, Rong Cheng, and Ziwei He. So I uh, just want to make sure that these names get mentioned uh, appropriately. Um, so molecular dynamics on biomolecular systems is used to study very complex systems. And you get a range of systems. For example, you could have, you know, a, a calcium pump, as you see here, uh, that undergoes very large conformational change to pump ions while it hydrolyzes ATP. Or you could have, you know, a kinase that actually also hydrolyzes ATP to uh, phosphorylate downstream proteins. That's more for signaling. Uh, you have, of course, conformational change or uh, that or configurational change in, in terms of the permeation of ions through channel. And you have also conformational change of the protein itself that regulates the function of biological channels like the potassium channel. And uh, you get also other conformational change, for example, uh, related to a voltage sensor that those for voltage sensitive proteins that uh, uh, depend on the, um, uh, the mem transmembrane potential. And uh, these are just a few examples. All these systems really perform their biological function because there are large conformational change that are uh, triggered by change in the environment or the conditions, getting the uh, balance of free energy between the two end states uh, in the simplest way is, is always very important. What are the factors that regulate these conformational change? And if possible, even try to understand the rate, the factors that govern the rate, the kinetic rate of these processes. And so I just want to go over you know, these systems to illustrate the kind of method that are used um, for uh, uh, characterizing these biological systems. Uh, by the way, a lot of the things that I'm talking about today are uh, described in a book that I just was self, uh, shameless self-promotion here. I just wrote this fairly short book for undergraduates. It's supposed to be elementary, and a lot of these, these uh, concepts are uh, talked about in the book. 
So, for example, the potassium channel, the KCSA channels is a bacterial channel, but it's very, very similar to many potassium channels uh, found even in humans. Uh, you have a selectivity filter that's responsible for the selective permeation of ions, but you also have pieces of the protein, like for example, an activation gate, which is essentially a door that can open and close depending on biological signals. And uh, the filter also can undergo a conformational change such that when you trigger the opening of the channel, trigger the opening of the gate, uh, here in the case of the KCSA, it's triggered by a change of, uh, of pH, whoops, no. The, uh, the channel starts to conduct, but then conducts less. And the, the way this is understood is that, you know, you, you trigger the opening of the gate with the stimulus. The, and this is for a population, it's the current from a population of channels. So the largest uh, population is open and conductive for a while. But then the population interconverts with a, a large fraction of the population where the filter is unable to conduct. That's why the, uh, the current diminishes. If you remove the stimulus, now you close back the gate and then the channel is still unable to conduct, but then will ultimately recover. And so these are the basic states of a, of a potassium channel. And many ion channels have this kind of, a, you know, uh, triggered gating through a stimulus, but also uh, inactivation over time. The, these are processes that are very common in among uh, many, many ion channels. So what do we do to study that? Well, we often use molecular dynamics simulation. This is the most trivial view of molecular dynamics, F equal MA with a, a crude uh, second order inadequate uh, uh, numerical algorithm that assumes the force is essentially constant over the time step, which is not quite the way we, we integrate these things. But essentially, you could imagine that the atoms are just like propagated uh, time step by time step in a discrete fashion like that. and. Uh, so what can we learn with that? Well, for example, if you take the potassium channel and you start from a conductive state and you run a long molecular dynamics, you can see from the cyan structure, this is a conductive channel, but it will make a spontaneously a, a conformational change to this gray conformation. And the gray conformation is actually a, a crystal structure of the inactivated state. And you see here the three waters that bind there, the, 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 the mesh plot is actually the density uh, coming from the crystallographic uh, 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 waters that are located in this pocket, but the waters actually came spontaneously during the molecular dynamics simulation. So this is about a microsecond, and you can see the transition was spontaneous, and uh, the final structure really matches quite well the uh, X-ray structure. So this is essentially, uh, uh, you know, recapitulating what is observed in the experiment, that you have a channel that has been opened with a stimulus, it's conductive for a while, and then we repeated these simulations several times, and the channel will inactivate over the process that is, you know, around a little bit shorter than a microsecond, for example, for the KCSC. And every time you get these water molecules that will bind behind the filter, like that, and in fact, the lowest water uh, hydrogen bonds to the backbone of the channel to stabilize that kind of conformation. It's a very, very uh, cool kind of conformation. Now, we want to understand this more quantitatively. And just running, you know, F equal ME on hundreds of thousands of atoms is not necessarily uh, so transparent what's going on. So typically, the way we try to understand these biological systems is to try to project what's going on into a smaller subspace. So big N here would be uh, a very, very large number, maybe like uh, 100,000. And little n would be a small number of collective variable. It could be only three or four or one, or it could be, you know, 50. But little n is supposed to be much, much smaller than big N. And this is a subspace of effective collective variable. Now, within that subspace, the dynamics is really effective. That means it's governed either by some sort of generalized Langevin equation or Langevin equation or Brownian dynamics or even a Markov model, but it's certainly not anymore just uh, reversible Newtonian dynamics. The quantity that is common to most of these uh, effective dynamics model is the potential of mean force that governs the relative free energy within that subspace, this W. And when you take the gradient of the potential of mean force, you get basically the microscopic uh, mean force. And this would be the memory function, for example. So in the generalized Langevin equation, this is the, the, uh, the form that you get. Now, the potential of mean force is a key thing in one dimension there are ways to calculate potential mean force for example if there are two stable states you could imagine there are two wells like that with a barrier in between and there are ways to calculate that for example with umbrella sampling or metal dynamics or you know 
uh, adaptive bias force. However, you can also go to a higher dimension and calculate potential of mean force. So when you look at a potential mean force in 1D, you see two wells, but what, what you don't see are what is supposedly associated with orthogonal degrees of freedom, orthogonal to Z1. And so if you imagine you have two degrees of freedom, like Z1 and Z2, there could be you know, something of importance, something of significance going on along Z2 that is uh, uh, changing the way the system would react. And you could imagine, oh, and so on and so forth, that the potential of mean force that you goes a little bit higher in dimensionality will carry more information. But however, there's, there's certainly a computational cost. You cannot go to an arbitrary high uh, dimensionality at some point. And so this makes your life a bit difficult and you have to be uh, you know, very parsimonious when you do these kind of systematic potential mean force calculation. So for example, in the case of the potassium channel, what governs the transformation from the conductive to the non-conductive state is a kind of a narrowing in the KCSA channel is a narrowing of the pore, you know, around the middle of the pore. So this distance is important. Now the pore is a tetramer. So in principle, you have two distances uh, because they're four subunits. So you, you could do the, the, the two subunit across the diagonal or the two other subunit across the diagonal. So there are two distances. It seems also that another thing that's important that is a slow variable here, is the entry and movement of an ion in the outer uh, side of the pore. This is the extracellular side and the movement of an ion along that. So we could, z we could call that Z. So if we want to take all these variables, that would be three-dimensional. And doing already a three-dimensional potential mean force is very computationally expensive. So if instead we replace R1 and R2 into a unique distance, for example, the, the average of these two, so that means we, we assume or we, we lump together the two distances, so we, we lose the perception of the asymmetry, and we have only d, the average distance, and z, now we have two dimensions, we can compute potential of mean force. And that's very interesting. For example, if you have a chat, and what you can see then is that it enables you to, uh, to characterize what's going on. Like, for example, if you have a very open channel, like 23 angstrom, that's the, uh, the activation gate that's opened by the stimulus. If the gate is very open, you can see that the y distance of the pore, so this is the z axis and this is the, the r axis, this is unstable and what is stable is this region where the ion resides around 10 angstrom from the uh, center of mass, so that would be uh, like this state, uh, c, no it's this state, c, and you're, you're narrow, you know, like you're at 5 angstrom, so this is an inactivated pore, and so in, in, if we project this two-dimensional potential into one dimension, you would see that the conductive state is not so stable and thermodynamically you'll be driven to the pinch state. But when you have a partially open uh, channel, like around 15 angstrom, then you can see the conductive state will be a little bit more stable than the pinch state. So that means that, you know, the, the uh, stimulus gate and this, this state A is conductive, is this state here, and uh, the B here is the... Uh, is trying to bring down the ion, but you're still you're still pinched. You see, so you see that that's why we we use the um, the z position as a slow variable. It's like also this is an important uh, part of the kinetics. So you can see that, the, for example, the here in, the, in this case with the potential mean force, that the um, uh, conformation of the intracellular gate control allosterically the status of the narrow pore, and so that's very important because that's also. Uh, 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 reflecting on the biological function of these channels. Um, I, I could talk, uh, you know, a whole hour on the potassium channel, but I want to really drive through and see other uh, kind of systems. For example, this is a calcium pump. This is a pump that consumes ATP. So it's called a P-type ATPase. That means at some point the pump uh, takes the phosphate from the ATP and, and bind it to an aspartic acid. So the pump is actually phosphorylated for a while, then gets dephosphorylated. During the pump cycle, you pump two calcium inside and you pump two proton outside. So this is uh, not electro, uh, it is electrogenic because this is a plus four movement of charge. And this is a plus two, so it's electrogenic. And the pump uh, pumps a, a calcium inside the uh, sarco endoplasmic reticulum that's close to uh, to have like a high concentration of calcium ready to release through the ryanidine receptor into uh, uh, myosin microfilament for muscle contraction. So it's very important to have a high concentration of calcium to do that. 
So how is the pump working? Well, this, this is a mechanism that's been talked about since the 1960s. It's called the alternating mechanism. It's called the E1, E2 pump. There's a whole slew of states. It's, a, it's called a pump cycle. That means that the pump is going around the cycle and then return to its first state. So this is like a motor. It's like an engine. And so you do a full cycle, then you return to the same state. You're ready to do the next cycle. In all these states, most of them, there are crystal structures for these states. You know, so, And this is the PDB idea of these crystal structures. So it's pretty stunning that we have access to all these crystal structures. And there's one side of the pump, the E1 side, is the, um, the binding site of the ions are more accessible to the cytoplasm. And the other uh, set of states, E2, you're uh, accessible to the lumen of the uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And so this is the kind of motion that the pump undergoes over the full cycle. And this movie is actually made from a coarse grain model uh, that was generated with what we call the, you know, a um, elastic network model. It's a two-state elastic network model. This is work that Avisek Das did, and we we construct the pathway between all the sequence of states according to the crystal structure. So, this is a coarse grain model where every residue is only a carbon alpha, but the pathway is physical. This is not just a simple morphing of coordinates in a linear fashion. It's actually an act, an actual physical pathway on that approximate surface. You could see the. Uh, the large extent of the motion. Now, using this very coarse grain pathway, you'd like to be able to understand how the, the full conformation are happening. Now, here we cannot really do just a simple 1D potential of mean force because the, uh, the conformational change it, between any sequence of state is extremely complex and uh, intuitively is very, very, very difficult to pick a, a Z, a collective variable, a unique collective variable that would capture you know the whole reaction and leave out all, all the orthogonal degrees of freedom would be fast degrees of freedom you know it, it's very 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 hard to do that and the reason why imagine like if i have a system like that where i have two wells and a barrier and i see this i say oh well that's simple there's two stable state and a barrier and then you imagine in a good case well if i expand to a higher dimension this is really what's going on that there are the two states, but they're correlated with Z1, and whatever is going on with Z2 is a kind of a trivial jiggling motion, and that's not important. And I could check that this is true by launching a lot of simulation at the top of my one-dimensional barrier, which would mean they're really here. And if I do that, half of them will go to the Z1 state, and half of them will go to uh, half of them will go to the left well, and half of them will go to the right well. And if I see, and if I do a histogram of what we call the probability to commit to one well or the other, and that's the pro probability committer density, if it's kind of sharply peak around one half, it means that yeah, Z1 is a representative good variable for that reaction. But just because I have two wells and a barrier, that not necessarily the case. I mean, if I have this system and I do again the simulation and i observe that my committer distribution is like a mess like that. it's flat that means that basically i am now you know there's another variable z2 that basically controls the fate of the reaction and because i don't see it in this one dimensional potential my my i'm missing completely this key coordinate and so i'm missing a key mechanistic aspect of the transition and what I'm doing is essentially a, 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 almost a waste of time. I mean, it's not a waste of time in the sense that you can still use this PMF to characterize the thermodynamic of the bottom of the well, because normally the bottom of the well is, in, whoops, is insensitive to your reaction coordinate as long as you monitor the bottom of the well correctly. But uh, it is not a good coordinate to monitor the transition itself. So what can you do? You know, you can't really increase to... Uh, you know, 10, 20, 50 dimension for a PMF. So how do we characterize a, a subspace of collective variable that is of higher and higher dimensional space? Well, you say, well, we, we believe that there is one dominant pathway in this collective variable space. And so now we uh, uh, resort to a technology that's called the string method that was um, maybe uh, you could say that the prehistoric uh, ideas of that go back to Ron Elber in the 1989, 1990 with Martin Karplis when they started to find pathways in, uh, for oxygen in myoglobin. But then the theory was really boosted very formally by uh, Eric van den Eyden, very um, misspell on his name here, I realize here. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, it was uh, 
you know, in the terms of statistical mechanics, it was really put on very, very uh, firm footing by work with Giovanni Cicotti and Luca Marigliano uh, in 2006. So essentially, it's trying to imagine how you could do a pathway monitoring the mean force. I mean, I'm simplifying here, but you're monitoring the, the mean force along the pathway. And you can imagine this is a bit like a, a rope in the Alps. I mean, you're all in Europe. So imagine you're trying to, uh, you know, um, climb up the Mont Blanc. You're a... You're a bunch of people who are climbing, and this is the, maybe a, a pass, a mountain pass. So everybody is roped in, and every one of those dots is a walker. And so the distance between the walkers is constant. And essentially, the tension in the rope will be directed along the rope. If the tension is not along the rope, that means the walker is going to fall off the cliff, you know, sideways. So essentially, what you would see is that the... The 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 the, the 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 force along the string should be along the tangent of the string. That means you've optimized the string in a way, and that's what and that's done on the mean force. So that's a statistical mechanical statement. You can also uh, uh, modify a little bit that statement in a more kinetic fashion by saying, if the uh, the the evolution of like let's say you suddenly cut the rope, or somebody uh, you know remove his uh, carabiner and then is released from the rope. If they fall along the slope, but they fall along the other walker, along the rope, that's their dynamical drift is along the rope. That is also a valid uh, measure of that. And so that's like the force times the diffusion tensor. Uh, orthogonal to the rope must be equal to zero. So this is what we use, actually. We, we use this in a, in a kind of a reformulation of the string method called the, the, transi the string method with swarm of trajectories is that when you have like a tentative uh, starting string like that and you say, I, I, talk, uh, I run dynamics and I'm going to take the mean drift from every one of those walkers and essentially I update my string until the mean drift orthogonal to the string is zero. I can uh, optimize my string. And the algorithm is you have multiple copy of your system. You run drift on that. You get the new position of the bees. You reparameterize and update your string. And this is when you try to optimize that string with this algorithm. You see that you drift toward the, uh, the saddle point. So this algorithm can work in pretty high number of dimension based on the assumption that you're trying to find a one-dimensional object, which is the string, in a sp embedded in a space of high dimension so it's kind of a uh, you know not a partial cheat but you would say we recognize that what's going on is in a subspace of higher dimension but we're trying to find an object of lower dimensionality a, a curvilinear object of the, uh, in that subspace and so you know go back to the calcium pump you know there's like four dominant states there's one where you're uh, the calcium can come from one side of the membrane, then it's occluded, then the calcium can exit on the other side, and then it's occluded. It's a pump cycle. I'm oversimplifying here. And what drives the conformation of the pump are the three domain, the green, red, and blue domain at the, uh, you know, uh, in the cytoplasm. And if you look at the motion of these domains, they really undergo very large conformational change. But the business end of the protein is the transmembrane part with the bions, the ion binding site. And that's here. You can see... When you're in this state, there's water going to the binding site. When you're here, you're occluded. When you're here, you have water going from the other side. And when here, you're occluded. And so this is what's going on. And you can see here, that this is the motion of the cytoplasmic domain. Um, and how did we get that? You see, I'm going to show you how we get that in a moment. So these motions are motion obtained by the string method over all the states, between all the pair of states along the pump cycle. So you see, these are fairly... So this is the occlusion of the pump as the, uh, the ATP is around here. And you can see here, the where's the ATP? It should be here. I don't see it. It's about to... This is... The, you can see the calcium. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, that's why I didn't see it. This is the opening of the luminal axis, the most dramatic thing. So the pump is phosphorylated already. We, I jumped a few states this year. So this is the actuator domain that will bind on top of the phosphorylated residue. And now this is the closed gate. The calcium is already inside. And you can see these gray balls move around. And now, bang, the pump is open like that. You see? So this pathway was generated with the string method uh, and optimized, you know, uh, over hundreds and hundreds of iterations. So these are 
all atom uh, pathways. So we have a membrane, we have the solvent, we have everything. But with the string method, we're able to compute the pathway between these uh, very, very non-trivial conformational change. And then we can use these pathways to try to guess what are the most relevant variables, perhaps then compute the free energy uh, landscape over two or three uh, simpler variables, you know, that will capture the, uh, the motion. And so one of the things that we did is actually when you open the gate here is that we have discovered a kind of intermediate, intermediate state here that was uh, then uh, uh, confirmed experimentally after uh, we have done the calculation, not necessarily as a result of our calculation, but they, certainly uh, we did not have a crystal structure of that. In fact, there's still not a crystal structure of that. There's only hint of that structure from uh, small angle scattering at this point. So this is for the pump. Another system is the kinase. It's also another system where there's non-trivial conformational change. So this is the inactive down-regulated conformation of the kinase. And this is the activated kinase. Uh, don't get too impressed with the SH2 and SH3 domain. In fact, if you truncated them, it would still be an activated kinase. So it just happened that they're reconstructed here on the end terminus of the enzyme. But in fact, they could be also floating in solution or elsewhere. What, but, the, but certainly the inactive state, they need to be back here. And in fact, this SH2 domain binds to the C terminus tail which is a tyrosine that's phosphorylated. And when you mutate this like that, the kinase is permanently activated and uh, you can get cancer. In fact, this was the first uh, oncogene uh, that was discovered in the late 70s by Harold Varmus, that if you truncate this green tail here, you get, you get cancer automatically. And so we're, we use the, um, is this? Yeah, this is the first time actually we had applied the string method on the activation of the kinase. So let me try to run this again. So what happened is that the helix rotates, this alpha C helix, and then um, the loop opens. You can see barely the motion. You know, I'm going to zoom on it a little bit more. So this was a little bit less involved than uh, this is another motion of that. You can see there's a salt bridge that will form between a lysine and aspartic acid. And so this was done also for the string method. This was done by... Uh, uh, a uh, graduate student in the lab the first time we applied the string method to a protein and uh, we've then used inspired by the string method we were able to pin down two collective variable that capture best the entire reaction and from that we were able to then compute a potential of mean force with umbrella sampling uh, from the inactive to the active state. So this is the truncated kinase when you remove the SH2, SH3. And you can see the inactive state is fairly stable, but the active state is also reachable a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's reachable. There's new NMR data that says actually it should be more reachable than that. So it's possible that either the force field that we use is not quite adequate or probably more likely that uh, you know, when we sampled that confirmation, which was basically done just from the on the basis of computation, there's something in the, the packing of the side chain or the confirmation of the protein that is not quite stabilized enough, and maybe there's some, some interaction should stabilize that well a bit further. But, but the general gist of it is that inactive state is quite stable. This is accessible. Now, if you have the SH2 domain in the down-regulated states, now look at that. That is stable. That is essentially now inactive and inaccessible. This is like 12 kcal per mole. It's essentially inactive. So you can see here completely the, um, the, the, the signaling role of these two uh, uh, binding domain, SH2 and SH3. Why is it that when they're present and the tyrosine is bound here, the kinase is inactive? You can see it in the free energy map directly. So that's very nice. You know, you can use this again, a bit like in the case of the channel, we can read the biological function directly from the free energy map. Now you can see that, you know, a kinase and the channels, they have many states and just doing things only with two states and a free energy profile is not always the full answer. So we'd like to be able to go further than that. And one of the methodology that's been developed in the last 10, 15 years is called discrete Markov state model, which essentially tried to partition the large conformational space um, into uh, uh, states that have a little bit more metastability. 
And normally, these uh, metastable states reside again in a subspace of collective variable, pretty much like the string method. So you have a collective space of variable. The space of collective variable, it may be you know, 10, 20, 50 dimensional. Um, and in that space, rather than building you know, a one dimensional curvilinear object, now we try to find clumps or you know, metastable state regions in that thing. And so typically we will have a denumberable st uh, number of states. We call those the micro states. And uh, that try to basically reduce the dimensionality of the problem by, by uh, creating discrete state in that subspace. But it's still you know, connected to the other method. And the general idea is the following. It's like if you run a very, very long trajectory uh, from F equal MA, molecular dynamics, and now you go look into the space of collective variable, you know, you reside and stop or jiggle once it's projected into that subspace. There are places where you stay for a longer time. And uh, if you assume now that the transition between these metastable state regions is um, uh, independent of where you came from, like whether you enter from this one or enter from this one, this, this transition probability is essentially independent. And so that means that then you could imagine starting from that, tr that state and run you know, to a finite simulation. And essentially the probability now is conditional, but the probability of making the transition is still the same. So you could run a bunch of separate trajectories and accumulate the data. And that is the general idea of Markov models that uh, VJ Pandey has uh, developed and also uh, uh, Christoph Schutte and Frank Noe with the software called PyEMA or MSM Builder for uh, analyzing Markov models like that. And so we had collaborated with VJ Panda on, on the kinase like that. And this is the free energy map that uh, on the, the, the loop and alpha C elix I showed you before. This is the inactive state. So essentially, it's the same that we did in the PMF before. I think I have it. No, I don't have it. Sometimes we compa I compare this to the other PMF. It's pretty similar. Of course, our PMF was calculated with a handful of microsecond of biased umbrella sampling, umbrella sampling data. This is calculated with 95 microsecond of aggregate data, unbiased data. So the Markov model is a powerful thing to, um, to study these complex systems. It's very rich. It is not a method to actually save computer time, in fact. So you have to be uh, uh, lucid about that and honest with yourself. This is not a method to save computer time. But it's a, a great way to characterize a system, I would say. Uh, the limitation of Markov models now are certainly uh, coming to bear now, especially when you apply them to ever increasing uh, complex systems, you know, systems of ever increasing complexity, because they, uh, you can see the limitation of Markov models, because uh, you cannot really converge these models very uh, easily. But nonetheless, it's possible to learn quite a bit with these kind of simulations. And so we've, one thing we've tried to do is ask the question, for example, if you took a protein like uh, this is able kinase able kinase is one of the first uh, kinase that was at a an inhibitor uh, developed by a um, uh, novartis called um, glivec and this is glivec here bound in the kinase it's a, an inhibitor of the kinase it was very specific and it was the first inhibitor of a kinase that was successful to treat a one cancer and ever since, you know, this was around the year 2000, and most drug companies now have been developing, uh, you know, kinase inhibitors because it's uh, really important. Now, I just talked to you about, you know, the alpha C helix and the, the A loop. That's actually this motion. These are the two important motion when you activate the kinase, but I'm almost lying to you. In fact, there's many moving parts in a kinase. There's the N terminus, N lobe, and C lobe. Those are fairly robust, don't move so much. But then you get the alpha C in orange, you get the A loop in green, but you get also the P loop. The P loop is the loop that binds to the, uh, on top of the ATP, and the P loop has many conformation. There's also another thing that is, you know, in the deep, uh, at the deep end of the pocket, it's called the DFG motif. It's a phenylalanine with an aspartic, and it's basically like a bicycle pedal. It can actually flip completely and changes conformation. These are on the A loop, of course, has many conformations. So these are just a few of the motifs that are can changing their conformation. It makes the life very difficult for people to um, 
uh, do drug binding and, and drug drug design because they never know what is the confirmation of the kinase. Like a drug, like Gleevec, binds only to the DFG out confirmation, cannot bind to the DFG in confirmation. And the P-loop must be in the kink confirmation, not in the extended confirmation. You can see this is the extended confirmation. So, so you'd like to be able to predict all those confirmation. But let's say you, even Gle uh, Abel has hundreds of crystal structure in the PDB, uh, we don't always know, oh my gosh, so, I guess, um, so we don't always know how to predict those confirmations. So what we did is we took all the ABLE confirmation of the PDB and we started aggregate simulation from that and obtained a Markov model. We also took all other kinase that are not ABLE and uh, created homology models. They're similar to ABLES, you know, like maybe 60% homology and, and more, but they're not ABLE. And we built a uh, homology model of those. And then we ran also a Markov model. And each Markov model was like 100 microsecond. We collected all the states and we found that by, by and large, the two, the two sets of simulations, which had nothing to do with one another, converged and uh, created similar population for these motif. That's very encouraging because it means the force field and the sampling and the mark of state machinery was sufficient at least to help you uh, converge this kind of model. In doing that, we actually discovered that one state of ABLE was not available in the crystal structure uh, in the PDB. And uh, one, one crystal structure, uh, I, I mean, like one conformational state of ABLE with, uh, was predicted by that Markov model that was not in the PDB. And we showed that to our collaborator uh, at uh, Eli Lilly and David Clausen. Actually, Eli Lilly has many, many hundreds of kinase structures in their database that are not public. And uh, so we gave them the coordinate of the state. They compared with their structure and found that um, indeed the predicted structure existed in their database. So they, this is, you can see here, the, the superposition of our Markov state model and their crystal structure. They're very, very similar. And that extra structure after that, I mean, like after the lawyers at Eli Lilly uh, signed all the paperwork, that structure has been then released in the PDB. So it shows that actually this kind of computational methodology could be used to predict all sorts of substates of a protein, even in the absence of an exact crystal structure, just having homology models. And presumably with enough sampling, you're able to predict structures that are not known experimentally and then use those to do drug binding. So that would be pretty nice. Uh, I have to rush a little bit here. So a last example I want to show you is a voltage sensor. So a voltage sensor is a part of the protein like a, of ion-gated channels, uh, uh, voltage-gated ion channels. But also this voltage sensor is sometimes found in things that have nothing to do with ion channels. For example, it's part of a voltage-sensitive phosphatase. The voltage sensor is usually a bundle of four helices. The fourth one of them has many arginine and lysines and is essentially changing its conformation in response to the transmembrane potential. And so here, this is the kind of conformational change where the uh, voltage sensor is changing from the low to, let me run it again, so from the down to the up state, you can see, and the, in the color you have uh, the arginines. So this was done with the string method. You can see that this is the confirmation that, come on, okay. So this was done by uh, Rong Cheng, and this is for the uh, phosphatase voltage sensor. So this is a non-trivial confirmational change. It's occurring in a membrane, and then using this string, which you see here, he calculated also a potential of mean force. Uh, the helix turns out that it is rotating. It's basically a sliding helix. It's sliding and rotation. It's, a, it's like a corkscrew motion. And whoops. <clears throat> and of course, because there's a, it's sensitive to voltage, at zero millivolt, this is a free energy map. But if you apply 150 millivolt, you can see that the equilibrium shift towards this thing thing. If you go to minus 100 millivolt, the equilibrium shift to the left down, down sick. And what you see is that, you know, the, the pathway is within a kind of a broad tube like that. And these are all the confirmation that you could see. And the, the, there's different base and there are basically four states along this entire thing, which we call the up plus, the up, the down and the down minus. 
But we wanted to do more than that. And so now let me dwell a little bit in some sort of new theoretical analysis for uh, um, you know slow conformational change. And this is a paper I put in this chat uh, for your interest. So imagine you have two states and they uh, sort of interchange very slowly. This is a generic two-state problem. So what could you do? Well, of course, the classic treatment is basically Chandler's uh, reactive flux formalism where you run uh, activated dynamics. And it says the total flux from the A state, let's say on the left, to the B states on the right, uh, would have something like uh, it would, you would have to calculate a population correlation function, which you can then split with, you know, a kind of initial part, which would be transition state theory. And then you have like a kind of a transmission coefficient. And that is the classical part. And the rate is really uh, when you go to a time tau that is where the, this uh, um, uh, transmission coefficient correlation function has sort of relaxed to a plateau. Key to this is, of course, these indicator function like HA, which is equal to 1 when you're in state B, and HB is equal to 1 when you're in state A. So this is actually the indicator function for state B, for example. And, but of course, you know, there are other ways to look at that stuff. The, this is the reaction flux formalism, and the rate is essentially that the limit of that where T goes to tau M, a relaxation time. But you can also use another theory, which also was developed in large part by David and Van den Eyden, uh, Van den Eyden where the, a correlation function of the committer contains the rate. And the, you could say that the rate from A to B is actually the limit of that correlation function to a time T, to a time tau. Now, what's kind of interesting is that the time tau is actually shorter than tau m. And I, I you know, the paper I attach to, to the, shows that why is the case. So tau is shorter than tau m. And you can see the similarity here is essentially the committer is a function. This is the committer to reach a state B. And so the committer is equal to zero when you're in state A and is equal to one when you're in state B. And it sort of swings, you know, uh, uh, between between one and zero uh, in the transition state region. And you can see the real similarity between the expression on the right and the expression on the left here. And it's almost as if, you know, the indicator function, the reactive flux formalism, is kind of a poor man's uh, committer, you know. And in fact, this indicator function would be a very good committer if you have an infinitely sharp barrier between the state A and state B. If you have like a state A and state B, and your barrier is very high and very, very sharp, then this equation would be exactly the same as that. And then in this case, tau M would be very close to tau. But in all other cases, the expression on the right is actually more robust. But that, that also suggests one thing, is that, well, if this is a poor man's committer, what can you do to make this poor man's committer at least better than, than really bad well this is an indicator function that depends on some sort of prescribed reaction coordinate x you say well what should be my best reaction coordinate and you can say well in my subspace of collective variable maybe i have a direction you know in the subspace z, z of collective variable you would say around some sort of transition state there's got to be a direction with a indicator vector n and the comparison between these two things says that n actually should be parallel to the gradient of the committer in that region. That's the only way you can make these two forms as close as possible. Sorry. And uh, let me elaborate on that. Like so, you know, if you look at the uh, the, the uh, population operator and you do just like a, some sort of toy model, you know, you see that the rate is uh, in black is coming from the population operator, you can see that it will go to, this is just a correlation function, so I'm not taking the derivative, but you see the slope gets the correct, uh, we get the correct slope after a certain time. The red one is the one with the committer. It gets the slope right away, you see? And if you took the coordinates, for example, ZZ, this is a one-dimensional example, then you also get the correct slope. Now, in some other cases, I mean, you can see, I said, that's all, you know, like, you can see that basically the committer correlation function, which you can write also like that, gets the right slope immediately in a very short time, whereas the population operator does not quite get the, the right slope right away. And uh, that's very suggestive. Like, you know, for example, if you have a very sharp barrier, 
the uh, population operator and the committer transition path theory will have the correct slope very quickly, even a very short time, you can see. If you have a medium barrier, they, they may do have some success, but you can see when you look at short time, the, the committer correlation function does a little bit better. If you have a very, very broad barrier, which is mostly the case in biology, then it's clear that the committer function will get the correct slope right away, but not the population operator. So it clearly, you know, you can do better than the reactive flux if you knew the committer through the formalism of reaction, um, uh, a transition path theory like that. Let me, uh, oh yeah, and these are the committers you get like, you know, the committers for something like that basically uh, swings very linearly across the flat barrier. Here it's a bit like an earth function, and here it's almost like the heavy side indicator function. So you can see that the committer really governs why these, these things work. And uh, if you have the, 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 uh, the committer correlation function, what you find is that you can actually use that committer react, uh, uh, correlation functions to find the best committer, because it is a variational principle that says, if you minimize the correlation function, you're gonna get the best committer as possible. I, I'm going fast on that. And so, uh, so that means that once you write your committer correlation function, you could expand it into a basis set, you know, with coefficient, and try to optimize your your uh, your basis set coefficient to get the best committer. And once you have that, I mean, it's like any uh, variation principle. You can basically like R three fuck you you throw in a basis expansion, basis set expansion, and you just optimize your basis set coefficient. And so we're able to to write you know this correlation function uh, with these matrices where here these these D's and these G's are correlation functions of the of the uh, basis function the F sub i and f sub j and then when you do the variational principle and the base set coefficient you just have a simple algebraic matrix equation to solve to get the best committer in that basis set expansion that's a fantastic trick and so this actually used on the voltage sensor to see where's the committer as a function of translocation rotation of the s4 helix and you can see the you can go from you know the one state to the next and this is the intermediate where the committer is around 0.5. And you can see here, actually, we don't have a lot of sampling in that region. So this is indicative that we need to sample more this region here. And basically, we can calculate where the gradient of the committer in this region and try to see what is the most relevant part of the transition to improve uh, our, our take on the problem. This is for that. You know, and this is essentially, you can also imagine that we would refine the string method. Imagine you have two wells in a high dimensional space and you want to optimize a string like that, where well, you could say, you know, in the old days, we would optimize the string based on the force or on the swarm, but now we can actually optimize a string based on the committer. And uh, this is simple 2D example, for example, uh, that was uh, studied by Attila Zabo, you know, whoops, where they played with the diffusion coefficient on X and Y, and when you do that, the, uh, the the direction of the committer in the region of the saddle point is changing. And, uh, you know, when delta is equal to 10, that means the diffusion coefficient along the y-axis is very fast. When delta is equal to 1, that means diffusion coefficient is the same in both directions. And when delta is 0.1, that means the diffusion coefficient in, along x is faster. And every time you do that, the best pathway across the saddle point changes its angle theta. And you can see that, you know, this is basically writing, this is the correlation function. And you can see the minimum of the correlation function is really changing the direction of the path. And so we can, we can do that and you can, you can basically optimize a string method based on the, the committer like that. We can move the beads and in, you know, in the shading area, you can see this is the committer. You can see the committer as a plane here in the ISO committer plane basically tilts here and this is the grade, the dash line is the, the best angle. It tilts and this is the grade of the committer. And we can do that. This is when, of course, it's isotropic. Then in that case, the best path follows the mean force. That's the real answer. And then when you change the diffusion coefficient, again, the best path will change its direction. Again, that's a fantastic way of uh, characterizing the best path across the saddle point like that. And, you know, I, I mean, I wish maybe I could have a bit more time, but I can show you here, you know, there's different... There's different vectors across the path. So these are the three cases. This is where uh, delta is uh, 10, this is delta 1, and this is delta 0.1. And you have different vectors at the saddle point. The gradient of the committer that 
is the most meaningful one is the red arrow and you can see it would be here here the red arrow all the arrows are in the same direction because this is the isotropic system and here and it's here but if you use for example the maximum reactive flux which eric van den Eyden has often emphasized that's the purple path you see actually the the uh, maximum reactive flux is in the direction of this yellow jagged curve that is basically the swarm of trajectory so the reactive plot uh, put, uh, 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 flux is in the direction of the the swarms but it's not in the direction of the committer only when you isotropic it's true and again here you see the the the, the maximum reactive flux is not in the direction of that so so the grade of the committer is really the way to go about these problems so just take home message and me finish 857 i guess i'm within the hour or so um we run all atom molecular dynamics simulation some things can be gleaned out of simple brute force simulation on these complex systems but when you try to capture things from brute force simulation two things must be important to you is that first of all is the biological process that you're after uh, as in a, a transition rate that would be accessible to your simulation if, if the transition rate is within microsecond perhaps you can see it in brute force simulation but that assumption is or is leaning on the un, unstated assumption that your force field has not messed up the barrier or messed up the relative free energy wells so that your model also has a transition within microseconds so because in biology you could have something as transition within microsecond but if your force field is a bit wrong and in the force field the transition as an energy barrier that's like three or four k cal per mole higher then all of a sudden your, your rate may be 80 microsecond or 100 microsecond and you may not see a spontaneous transition so the brute force simulation is very nice but it has its limitation then free energy landscapes is a more systematic way to characterize these systems free energy landscape go directly at the process you're looking at you have to pick uh, a few collective variable maybe one or two or three to um, to characterize the system and then you can characterize the free energy landscape and even if your force field is somewhat wrong like you know the balance of the free energy well is not quite perfect you will see it in the pmf and you will then get you know meaningful and useful information despite the inaccuracy of your force field so so you you don't lose all your your computer time running on bias simulation and getting garbage at least you see what you have if you want to boost your understanding in the collective space of in the space of collective variable uh, without uh, uh, having to run pmfs uh, at a very very high dimension then you can use the string method and find a curvilinear pathway you could find even curvilinear pathways if you believe that there are different pathways in that subspace uh this is still challenging and it's uh you know not it's an undertaking that requires some some effort but it's still more achievable than uh, you know running a, a free energy landscape computing free energy landscape in 10 dimension that is not currently feasible so the string method is a good tool for that and i illustrated this on uh, four systems for example a potassium channel inactivation uh, intermediate states of the calcium pump kinase regulation voltage sensor domain another technology that's a little bit different is the mark of state model which is a little bit more like a fishing expedition because in principle you try not to bias anything and you just accumulate states and states and the problem is that you know the number of states for a system is an extensive property and so if you have a system that's only a polypeptide of 20 amino acid your number of micro states is not that large if you try to do a markov model on something like the ribosome or the calcium pump the number of micro states that you would need really increase very very much and so the number of states potentially for these systems is an extensive variable and uh as the number of states increases you need m more and more and more simulation to actually document the transition from state i to state j i mean if you never have a state if you never have a transition between state i and state j then you just don't know about it actually worse than that is that if you have only a transition from state i to state j but there's never a transition from state j to state i that means now your simulation is irreversible 
and it's essentially misleading. You cannot use it because it violates microscopic detail balance, and you you, you cannot really uh, build a, a decent uh, a Markov model out of that. And so there are pathologies. So Markov state models are great, but you have to be very aware of their limitation. Something that's a little bit more um, deliberate and directed is a committer a consistent variational string method or, or you know, things that r rely on the variational principle with the committer with the uh, reactive flux because then you really choose the um, absorbing state. You say, I want to go from state A to state B. And essentially the committer is like trying to optimize the eigenvector that you know, that governs or controls the relaxation between two states. <coughs> it relies on the assumption that they, if there are other metastable states, they don't dominate the relaxation time. So if that's the case, you would have to, you know, expand that methodology to different states. Uh, on the other hand, if the, the states are, if you, it's just a rugged pathway and there's just a short-lived uh, intermediate states, this, this committer consistent uh, variational principle is a very powerful way and it's more directed so you, it's less a fishing expedition than the mark of state model so it's potentially more powerful i think i i should acknowledge many of these uh smart people who have been um uh contributing to the work over the years uh and many conversation with attila zabo jonathan ware aaron dinner and sergey krivov who have been uh you know uh answering my questions when I was confused about all these uh, theoretical developments. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be only too happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Benoit, for this very lightening uh, presentation, where we are nowadays and the coming uh, challenges. So I remind you all that now we have this uh, Q&A session where all of you can ask questions. Uh, the channel of communication is through the Q&A uh, functionality of Zoom. It's enough that you simply indicate you want to ask a question, and then we will unmute you so that you can uh, directly address your question to Benoit and then take the conversation from there. So there is uh, one first question that was posed by Titus Van Erbe because it was uh, towards the end of your presentation. I thought it was better to reserve it to now so titus uh, you can ask the question directly yourself i read Hello, it too. Yeah. i read it too. do you hear me yeah do you hear me okay. yes yeah. i was uh, running in the corridor from uh, from, uh, from, uh, the the so, uh from, uh from there's a terrible the echo all of a sudden <laughs> Okay, lower down my volume, maybe. Um, so my question is: uh, this, uh, this method is based on the uh, commitment. What should you do if your system is uh, inertia dependent? Should you switch to a to a phase space committer, so momenta dependent, or should you take the uh, velocity averaged uh, committer? What is the most, uh, say, fundamental part or the most practical uh, function to use in, in that case? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me read again your question because I'm not if there was a lot of echo. So, if inertia effects are important, should we consider a committer that is momentum dependent in phase space as opposed to a committer that's just position dependent? And that is absolutely a very interesting question. I think it depends a little bit what you want to do because. Um, if you consider the committer as just being, imagine you have a system where there's inertia. In fact, in the paper that I attach, I did simulate a system where there is inertia, which would mean then that at very, very short time, the propagation in the collective space of coordinate is not Markovian because momentum is an additional variable, it is missing. So that means in principle, if you take a, a Langevin equation and you now try to do just a configuration dependent collective space that is not Markovian, it will become Markovian only at, at a certain lag time. So the way I see this is that imagine you have characterized the, uh, the, the committer of the system when the, um, uh, the system is a Markovian in, in a coordinate space, that's a function Q of Z, 
if you try to go to shorter time, that function is not the correct committer. It is not. When you go to the correct lag time, it is the correct committer if you propagate for a time tau. Now, what happens if you have inertia? You can still use that function q of z at shorter time. It is not a committer. A little bit the same way that the indicator function in the Chandler theory, the Chandler theory, remember, is applied all the time to system where there is, uh, you know, uh, inertia. And uh, that means at short time, that, that system will not have the correct flux, and you have to increase the lag time until the system becomes Markovian, you know. And that would mean that uh, you, you, you would have to increase the time t Un until the, 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 the uh, correlation function becomes linear with the slope that's linear. And that would, be, uh, that would be like the plateau value in the reactive flux. So, you know, if you're not really interested in characterizing the momentum as part of the reaction, you could use a configuration dependent um, uh, uh, committer in an inertial system. It's just with the understanding that this is not the committer at all time. It, it is only the true committer at, at a certain lag time, but it is still a good, a good uh, a basis function to look at how the system is is uh, relaxing. I think. Oh, the second question: Should I read it myself or? <clears throat> well, uh, Jordi. Yeah, I, I can I can repeat it, Benoit, if you want. Yeah, so, go ahead. So my question in parallel is 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 quite naive, uh, and, and I'm just starting with. Uh, with this, uh, with the use of Markov state models, and we are using uh, structure-based modeling. Okay, so the point is that um, using uh, structure-based modeling, which means that uh, we are using native contacts in order to force the system to be in one state or the other. Okay, I'm not quite sure right now uh, if we should have care about uh, uh, controlling the bias, the possible bias that the uh, forcing of, of the native contacts in one of the states or the other. Uh, may introduce into the Markovian uh, problem. I, I'm not so sure what you mean by structure-based modeling. Like, uh, can you be more specific? You have a crystal structure. Yeah, let me simplify it a lot. Like, imagine a goal model, okay? A goal-like model, okay? Okay. You have a goal-like model in which you have a state that uh, contains some native contacts and a uh -huh. state that doesn't, right? Uh, so my point is, I'm not quite sure right now. Uh, for sure, I have to read more. <laughs> but uh, if, if should we uh, introduce this bias that we are forcing, because we are forcing the system to be in one particular state with the native contents, right? Yeah. Um, if if that is something that may affect the final analysis in the Markov state model. Well, I, you know, that's that's kind of a the, the Markov model, in my opinion, is just a, it has a. a deceptive simplicity but it's kind of more wicked because in principle if you have a, a uh, you cover all the space with micro states and you start in a micro state then there's no memory and then just by the virtue of starting there you have not really biased the system you've biased it only by the initial condition but that's accounted for and now you're ready to compute the transition from that particular state to the other states. So that that would look that you're creating a model where you are free to launch independent on bias trajectory from a multitude of states and nothing is biased. Literally, that would be true. The problem is that when you define your micro states in the, in the space of collective variable, which in the language they call the feature space, and I think in MSF Builder in Payamo they called it the feature space, is that, you know, of course, if your feature space is, for example, distances or contacts or something like that, well, there's a lot of other coordinates in the atomic coordinate set that are not the feature space. So that this is really a reduced set. And the big question is, like, by the virtue of biasing these features, did you allow enough time to the remaining atomic coordinates to be unbiased, or do they carry some sort of hysteresis? for a long time that's going to basically mess up your analysis and uh, that's a little bit more like a can of worm you know if there are some slow variable that are not in your features and uh, you you run a markov model where you start in arbitrary micro states you're going to pay the price like this thing is going to remember that you bias it and your micro state are not really that meaningful so it's not so trivial 
to uh, you know the the Markov state. I think is uh, has a very deceptive simplicity with this, but it it is a little bit treacherous. Um, so I think you know one way to do that is also to you know leave half of your data out, looking at what you get. You know, you know parsing different pieces of your aggregate data differently to see if uh, the thing is converged. But it is definitely challenging. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I, I hope I'm sorry because I had a problem with my connection. I hope it's not too noisy yet now. So there is a, a next question by So Young Park. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks to very nice talk and it's very uh, also enlightening my understanding of where we are. And my question is about uh, uh, how to optimize a collective variable for the reaction path or something. Well, recently the machine learnings uh, greatly facilitate people to figure out what are the, the relevant reaction, the code collective variables for, along the path. But well, after I hear your talk, I think that maybe committer, if the, the commit, committer based approach works well, do we still need to stick on the machine learning? Because sometimes the outputs from machine learning is not very human interpretable. Yes, yes, it's a very good question. In fact, uh, we are in the process of trying to link these ideas to machine learning too. And the way my perception of this works is that when you do machine learning, you're trying to find what is the combination. First of all, you're trying to discover the subspace of collective variable that's relevant. And uh, in that subspace of collective variable, let's say Z, what is the f Z, what are the functions themselves? You know, what is really the, 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 the foundation for the slow variable, the most meaningful slow variables? And um, it's not entirely clear that uh, all this uh, is, uh, is is working as automatically as people make it to be. I mean, like for example, uh, uh, Pratyush Tiwari, uh, whom I I, uh, I like a lot, is and I like his work a lot. Uh, likes to use machine learning, but will use a linear combination of collective variable to try to find the best reaction coordinate, and so that's the best direction through the transition state. And he believes that currently machine learning on nonlinear combination is almost untrustworthy. He, he prefers to, to enforce a linearity. It's a bit like Tika, you know, the, the time lag uh, component analysis is also yep. a, uh, a, to try to do a linear combination. And, you know, throwing in nonlinearity, if you cannot control what comes out, is is more wicked and treacherous than than actually controlling what gets out. So that that's you know that means that uh, one has to be very cautious with that. I would say every time people use machine learning, also they usually learn, they usually attach that to some sort of variational principle. One of the variational principles that they've used is, for example, the uh, the spectral decomposition that Frank Noe has worked on with the Markov state model to say, like, you have a bunch of state uh, of uh, eigenfunctions that you are to optimize to capture the slowest variables, which is the same principle that governs Tika. And uh, so this is this is a variational principle. But if you have the variational principle with the committer, with the reactive flux, it is also a variational principle. It's just a more uh, deliberate and more narrow variational principle that perhaps is able to um, confine this this machine learning in a better way. So I, I think that uh, potentially this thing can be uh, inserted in these algorithm in a very fruitful way. It's not been done yet, but I, my impression is that it can. Uh, so uh, it means that uh, machine learning people need to uh, use the linear combination. Yeah, you know, the machine learning is, I have the impression the machine learning is a tool to do one part of the job, yeah. which is discovering what is the combination of, of atomic variable that creates a subspace of collective variable. And then within that subspace to find where is the gradient 
of the committer that is the most uh, representative of the dominant part of the reaction. You know, let's say it's a two-state system. This is really what it's trying to do. But the more you're able to formulate the question theoretically, to confine, you know, the problem, the more the machine learning now will have to search something that is less vague, perhaps more well-defined, and has more chance to converge. Because machine learning, you know, is not guaranteed to converge very well unless you have an enormous amount of data, but will converge better if your your uh, formulation of the problem is more narrow and well defined, so you know having a better formulation will strengthen these methods. This is not what I describe is not antagonistic to machine learning. I think it's designed perhaps to to help it. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your answer. Um, yeah, uh, now I feel <laughs> better with machine learning. Yeah, yeah. We, we may go to the the better way with the committer-based approach with machine learning. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any urgent questions, so I think it's a good time to, to move to the next uh, talk. So thank you very much, Benoit, for this very insightful uh, discussion. And now we'll have uh, the first of the two uh, presentations made by the uh, uh, younger researchers among us. So the first one will be Beatriz Pinello from the University of Barcelona. She will be talking about aspergine tautomerization and the molecular mechanism of uh, protein. So please, uh, Beatriz. Okay. Um... You can see my screen? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, we can. Um, good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank SICAM uh, for organizing this event and, and, and inviting me, giving me this opportunity to present my work. Um, my name is Beatriz Pinello, and I am a PhD student in the group of uh, Carmen Rubira in the University of Barcelona. And my main uh, research interest is enzyme catalysis. And so today I will talk about my work uh, about the molecular mechanism of uh, the enzyme protein of focosyl transferase uh, one. But first, uh, before I, I would like to introduce a class of enzymes that are glycosyl transferases. Uh, glycosyl transferases act on carbohydrates and uh, they catalyze the formation of glycosidic bonds. To do so, uh, they bind to molecules, one uh, which is called the donor, uh, which is uh, usually a, <coughs> uh, a sugar attached to phosphate living group, and another one which is an acceptor uh, usually another sugar, uh, but it can also be a peptide or a lipid, a nucleic acid. And so the glycosyl transferases um, transfer this uh, sugar moiety uh, to the acceptor, forming a new glycosidic bond. Um, the mechanism of an inverting glycosyl transferase, uh, a type of glycosyl transferase, um, is in this picture. Um, here we can see that the acceptor attacks the anomeric carbon uh, of the sugar donor uh, to form this uh, new glycosidic bond. Um, in order to do so, uh, the acceptor needs to be deprotonated uh, by a catalytic base, which is usually a, a residue, uh, which can be an aspartate, a glutamate, or histidine. Now I want to introduce uh, the main topic, which is um, the enzyme of focosyl transferase one or PFOD one, uh, which we can see here in gray. Um, PFOD one um, catalyzes the reaction between a donor, which in this case is GDP fucose, the fucose is the sugar, and um, an acceptor, 
which uh, are a class of uh, small peptides called epidermal growth factor like uh, domains. And so uh, the biological importance of POFOT1 comes from the fact that um, it's, it has been linked uh, to several diseases, such as uh, dowling degos disease and uh, some types of cancer. And so um, it, uh, POFOT1 uh, is a potential uh, therapeutic uh, target, which is the reason uh, to study its mechanism. Mm, okay. Uh, to, in order to model uh, the enzyme, um, the reaction of an enzyme, uh, we need an X-ray structure of this of this enzyme. So the first one for POFOT1 appeared in uh, 2011, and then there were two more in uh, 2017. One of them uh, used in this work. Okay. Um, from the first X-ray structures, uh, it was apparent that the active site of POFOT1, which we can see here, um, there was something missing, which, is, which was that there were no residues that could act as a catalytic base, as I described uh, before in this um, classic or canonical mechanism for glycosyl transferases. Yep. So without the catalytic base, um, we need to look for alternatives and um, there were some proposals. The first one, which I've called uh, option one, uh, was, uh, first proposed by uh, Lira Navarrete and co-workers and included the deprotonation of the uh, acceptor via, uh, via a water molecule. So this water molecule would take the proton from the acceptor, allowing it uh, to um, form the glycosidic bond. And this is the active site again. And well, this mechanism could be reasonable because um, there is a water molecule in the active site which could be placed um, uh, in, in, so in a way that uh, could have this role in the, in the mechanism of POFOT1. So this is one possibility. And then there is option two, which uh, was proposed uh, by Lee and uh, co-workers. And it's the deprotonation via an asparagine, asparagine 51, that is in the um, active site, close to the acceptor. And so in this mechanism, well, the, um, the asparagine oxygen would take this proton from the acceptor, as we can see here. Um, this mechanism, this uh, form of deprotonation uh, would be very, quite unusual, actually, but uh, it has been proposed that asparagine could have a similar catalytic role in other enzymes. And also um, it was proven that aspar this asparagine was essential for uh, the activity of POFOT1. So um, the the, this uh, option, this proposal of mechanism is uh, reasonable as well. And we also have to say that in both uh, mechanisms, the uh, final recipient of the proton would be the an oxygen in the beta phosphate from the from the donor from the GDP. Okay, um, so the objective, the main goal of our investigation was to model the reaction catalyzed by POFOT1 and to see if maybe it was one of these two proposals or maybe something else. So obviously to a study a, a catalytic mechanism, uh, we need to allow the breaking and formation of bonds in our simulation. So uh, we need quantum mechanics. In our case, uh, we used uh, Pinish molecular dynamics, specifically with uh, TFT, and uh, we use the software um, CPMT. Um, a Pinish molecular dynamics has two main limitations um, for uh, the study of enzymatic reactions. One of them is the size of the system, as usually in this type of simulation, we can simulate uh, hundreds of atoms and uh, an enzymatic complex uh, can have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of atoms. And so to overcome this problem, obviously we use the uh, well-known technique of QMMM in which uh, there is a QM region that is treated in a higher level of theory. 
these atoms in the QM region are the ones that are going to participate directly in the reaction. And then the environment, the rest of the, of the enzyme and the solvation um, is treated in, uh, in a classical way. The other main limitation is a time scale limitation um, because the um, uh, enzymatic reactions usually uh, take uh, place at a much longer time scale than what is um, feasible to do with uh, pH molecular dynamics. So we needed an enhanced sampling technique, and in this case, or we use metadynamics as uh, implemented in the software of uh, Plumt. Now uh, we'll give some um, details about the model. Um, first, the complete model was built using, using in this case, two uh, crystallographic structures. So uh, we could have uh, the whole pack, the enzyme, the donor, and the, uh, and the acceptor, everything to have the reaction. Then we did classical molecular dynamic simulations, in this case, with uh, AMBER software. And um, then we went on to, uh, after we found a suitable configuration to do the reaction, we uh, passed on to QMMM, MD, and metadynamics. Um, when we defined the QM region, uh, it, it had 55 atoms, and it included um, the, the species that were going to react, the acceptor, the donor, but also uh, this uh, asparagine and this water molecule in the active side in order to test uh, both uh, mechanisms or that to, the two mechanisms would be possible in our simulation. Then the collective variable uh, we chose uh, was uh, this difference of distances between the uh, oxygen of the threonine and the anomeric carbon of, the, of our sugar, of the fucose and the distance from this very same carbon to the oxygen of the phosphate in GDP. So the bond that was going to be formed and the bond that was going to be broken. And here are some um, dynamics parameters that we used. Okay, so then uh, the metadynamic simulation was successful in driving the, the, the reaction from reactants to products. Here is a, a picture of the Michaelis complex, and here a plot of uh, the different um, distances along the reaction coordinate. And well, here in the first picture, we can see that uh, the oxygen of the threonine, uh, the oxygen, not uh, the hydrogen, and the asparagine are, um, uh, are making a, a, a hydrogen bond, which is consistent with what we saw in the X-ray structure. And so the reaction continued um, because the, um, the oxygen from the threonine uh, was um, getting closer to the anomeric carbon and also the bond of the anomeric carbon with the GDP was uh, getting broken until uh, we ended up in the transition state. So in this transition state, the bond between the threonine and the carbon is um, almost formed, but not quite, but because it's still over two angstroms long, this distance, so it's not completely formed. And uh, the bond between the oxygen and the carbon, um, the oxygen of the phosphate, is almost completely broken, almost at three angstrom. We can also see that now this arginine in the active side is um, interacting with uh, the oxygen, uh, uh, to um, accommodate to this, this uh, negative charge that is forming. And another interesting feature is that um, the proton from the threonine has not still, it's still attached uh, to the threonine. It's not, has not yet been transferred, but this interaction with the asparagine is kept. But there is a difference in the asparagine because now it is interacting with uh, the, the, the phosphate, which was not before. So this is going to prepare with, to what is going to happen, which is that, well, the new glycosidic bond uh, has been formed between theonine and the, and the fucose. And 
the proton finally has been transferred from the uh, theonine to the asparagine, and at the same time, the asparagine transferred uh, one of its own protons to the beta phosphate. Um, and so we ended up with uh, this asparagine in its tautomeric form. We can also see that uh, this beta phosphate is the final recipient of uh, the proton. Um, if you remember, uh, back in the introduction, I talked about two possibilities for this mechanism. And what we obtained uh, in this simulation is uh, this option two, the deprotonation via this asparagine. Uh, this is the free energy profile of the reaction. Uh, we can see that it's a single transition state and that is consistent with an SN2 reaction. Um, the energy barrier is, is of about 16 kcal per mole and that is in good agreement with experimental reaction rates which would predict a barrier of between uh, 17 and 19 kcal per mole. In order to further investigate the role of this asparagine, it was mutated by our collaborators in kinetic experiments. Uh, on the one hand, it was mutated to alanine, and um, it also was mutated to aspartate. Uh, to alanine, we would expect that uh, the enzyme lost um, its activity, but to aspartate, um, I mean, aspartate has uh, obviously a, a carboxylic acid in the side chain. So it could, uh, in theory, deprotonate this threonine. And I mean, it's the canonical base in other glycosyl transferases. So it could act like this. We um, asked ourselves, it could um, rescue the activity. But uh, the activity in food one was killed in both cases, the alanine mutant and also aspartate. So um, to maybe uh, find an explanation as to why it was like this, uh, we performed uh, some simulations in which uh, this, par this paragene was mutated virtually to an aspartate and, and we performed classical molecular dynamics. What we found was that the, the, as the aspartate uh, adopted a conformation um, downwards looking uh, on to the other side, the opposite side, from the, from the phosphates, probably by um, electrostatic repulsion. And so it stayed like this for most of the simulation. And at the same time, it formed a very strong uh, H bond, uh, hydrogen bond with the threonine. So it kept the threonine looking downwards as well. And uh, that could be the reason why this, um, this uh, reaction would not happen because the aspartate was keeping this threonine, could not happen. So, because the aspartate keeps this threonine um, too far away from, from the sugar for it to react. So, um, these results are uh, consistent with uh, an, a catalytic role for the asparagine. Uh, finally, to sum up my presentation, um, QMMMD and with dynamic simulations um, have revealed the mechanism of PFOD1. Here, well, here is a small movie to remind you of the mechanism. Oh, it's not working. Well, <laughs> anyway, um, the reaction uh, follows an unusual mechanism in which a proton transfer is mediated by a tautomeric asparagine residue. And mutagenesis studies of POFUT1 confirm the essential role of the active site asparagine in the enzyme activity. And so we hope that these results uh, shed some more light into this, uh, me to this mechanism of POFOT1 and perhaps uh, be useful in order to uh, design inhibitors or other molecules that could act in, in this enzyme. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the other co-authors of the work which did these uh, kinetic experiments and also my supervisor, Carmen Rovira, and the, my uh, lab mates, my colleagues from our lab, uh, the funding agency, and all of you for listening. So thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, Beatriz. Uh, now we have uh, time for, for questions and uh, conversation or discussion. I remind you that you can uh, pose your questions through the Q&A channel. Simply indicate your interest in asking a question and then uh, we will unmute you. Uh, while we wait to see if there is any additional question, I, I had a curiosity is more from the methodology. We, we had heard in the previous talk this the, the importance of identifying the relevant variables in these very complex systems. So here you, you have explained a choice of, of what is your reaction coordinate or the relevant collective uh, variables and so on. Do, do you have uh, an idea of, I mean, in your experience when you choose them, is it very critical which ones or do you try different ones to try to identify the robustness of the uh, mechanisms that you work with to the particular choice of these collective variables? Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I think the choice of collective variables is very critical to the to the outcome of, of the stimulation. Um, in our case, we chose this uh, collective variable because as we didn't know uh, the full mechanism, the, the protonation was the main question. So we only biased um, those distances that we knew were going to participate in the reaction because it was, it had to be, the product had to be formed. Um, uh, but uh, yes, uh, sometimes um, some C uh, CVs that you think are going to work uh, don't. And so, yeah, we sometimes uh, test um, different ones. And yeah, it's, it's certainly a, a very crucial part of the process, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We have uh, another question by Jordi Villa Frisha. Uh, Jordi, you can pose the question directly yourself. Hi, Beatriz. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was very clear and very, very nice. Uh, I have a, a, a question regarding CPMD because I'm not, I'm not very familiar on how it works. Um, do you have the chance to uh, evaluate the PK of the, in this case, of the, of the general basis that you are using to accept the, the initial problem? So is there, is there a way that uh, you can isolate the, the mechanism of the PK process in order to get that value? Um, uh, hi, I thank you for your question, Jordi. Um, we haven't done it. Um, I, I've read in, in the literature the, some calculations for the, from the PKA of, of some residues, but uh, we personally haven't, haven't done them. We um, usually we only think about this, um, PKA when we model the systems to know the protonation of the relevant residues and so on, but uh, we don't calculate it. But yeah, I think um, it's it's possible, even though it would not be the same in a aqueous solution, I guess, that uh, in my enzyme or my enzyme or whoever's enzyme, um, as the environment um, affects uh, this value. But yeah, we, we, we haven't done it, but I guess it would be possible. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. I do not see any urgent questions. I, I remind for, for those of you who have registered for this event that after this first part, then we will move to the gather room. And there in the gather room, there is also a, a Beatrice poster among the rest of the posters. So that also gives you the opportunity to approach her uh, for a more informal uh, sure. discussion if you want. Yeah. So thank you very much, Beatrice. And we thank will. You move uh, to the last speaker of this first part of the event. This is Samyak Mukherjee from the Ruhr University Bochum. And he will be talking about the entropy of water in protein condensate. So please, Samyak, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, is it visible, right? Yes. Yeah, and I'm visible. audible. Yes. OK. Um, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, uh, depending on your geography coordinates. Um, I would like to thank the CCAM organizers for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to present my work today. Uh, I am Shomok Mukherjee from the Ruhr University at Bochum. And uh, today I will be talking about the entropy of water in uh, protein condensates. So uh, to give a context of the research so that we are all on the same page, um, protein condensates are formed by a process known as liquid-liquid phase separation of proteins. 
this is a, a phase transition phenomenon where a uh, high concentration liquid like phase of protein and a uh, low concentration liquid like phase of protein uh, uh, is separated out so uh, here we have uh, let me switch to the laser mode um, okay so here we have um, a schematic uh, phase diagram a temperature versus concentration phase diagram for uh, the, this llps process this white region uh, represents a one phase system uh, where on the left hand side we have the low concentration uh, uh, phase and on the right hand side we have the high concentration phase and the shaded region within this dome this is the coexistence between these two concentrated phases <clears throat> And this process of LLPS, it's a thermodynamically driven process. And uh, what we are interested in today are the water molecules that are present inside these protein condensates. So the main question that we are going to ask is uh, whether the water molecules um, uh, or the thermodynamics of the water molecules, the entropy of the water molecules contribute to this uh, driving, the thermodynamic driving force of this uh, phase separation process. Uh, so for that, we have chosen uh, two systems. One is a globular protein, a human gamma D crystalline, and the other is an intrinsically disordered protein, which is the low complexity domain of fused in sarcoma RNA binding protein, in short, uh, FAST LCD. Um, so this is an IDP, it does not have a, a specific secondary structure. And for each of these systems, we have chosen six concentrations of the proteins. So here you see these are the six systems for uh, gamma crystalline, and here we have the concentrate six uh, concentrated systems for the uh, first LCD. Now um, we have sim used uh, all atom molecular dynamic simulations in Gromax, and each of these systems have um, something between like a ten thousand or a hundred thousand uh, water molecules in the systems, and we will calculate the entropy of these water molecules. But the problem uh, with calculating liquid entropy is that there is no specific analytical theory to uh, deal with the entropy of liquids because they have a diffusive component. They are not, uh, you cannot use a harmonic or a quasi harmonic approximation to these systems. So we will be use uh, a method known as the two phase thermodynamics method, uh, which was introduced by Lin et al in 2003 and has been used to calculate the entropy of several liquids uh, under several conditions um, successfully. So the crux of the um, of this method is that um, we get the spectral density of liquid, in this case water, from the Fourier transform of the velocity autocorrelation function. And this uh, liquid spectral density is then divided into two parts. One is a harmonic oscillator-like solid, and the second one is a hard sphere-like gas part. The uh, advantage of doing so is that these two systems, the solid and the gas, this can be exactly treated analytically. And then at the end, when we get the solid-like entropy and the gas-like entropy, uh, we use uh, an, 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 uh, a parametric uh, formulation, uh, including these two uh, entropy terms to get the entropy of the liquid. The other advantage of this uh, method is that since from MD simulation trajectories, we can get both the translation and the rotation of uh, rotational velocities of water molecules. So using this method, we can get both the translational and rotational contributions uh, to the liquid entropy or water entropy. But before we uh, go into the results, I want to stress on one point that um, the time scales that are required for uh, the whole uh, phase separation process are not accessible by all atom MD simulations, uh, classical MD simulations. So what we are doing is we are not simulating the whole LLPS process, rather we are simulating several of these um, snap, uh, several of these concentrations or protein condensates themselves, not the process it's, uh, and we will uh, study the water molecules in these condensates. So here I have plotted the total entropy of the water in the systems as a function of protein concentration. On the left-hand side, we have um, this uh, graph for uh, gamma crystalline, and on the right-hand side, we have the same for first LCD. And you can see that with the increase in protein concentration, the entropy of the system decreases, which is um, kind of expected uh, because the constraint is increasing. But now, as I mentioned, we can plot the translational and rotational entropy separately. So here I have plotted the uh, translational and rotational contributions per entropy. And the values over here 
are normalized with respect to their corresponding bulk values at the given temperatures. Uh, the interesting thing is that you can see that uh, in both the cases for gamma crystalline and first LCD, there is a crossover between the translation and the rotational entropies uh, around this region. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, you can see that the rotational entropy is actually becoming greater than bulk entropy at lower concentrations not the translational entropy. In both the cases, rotation becomes uh, greater than the um, bulk rotational entropy. So to uh, so why is that? Um, so to investigate that, we calculate the number of water-water hydrogen uh, bonds and the water-protein hydrogen bonds. So um, water um, itself has an extended hydrogen bond network. It's a very intricate uh, chain of hydrogen bonds, but in the presence of the proteins, these hydrogen bonds are broken. So if we calculate the number of water-water hydrogen bonds per water molecule, which is the blue line over here, and the number of protein water hydrogen bonds per water molecule, we find that with increasing concentration, the number of water-water hydrogen bonds decreases, whereas the number of protein water hydrogen bonds increases. But still, at these uh, lower concentrations, the values of uh, the, the value does not reach the bulk value, which means that in principle, the total number of hydrogen bonds that the uh, water molecules have in a, on an average is still lower than bulk value, which means that they are not as bound as the bulk and they have greater rotational degrees of freedom. This gives them a higher rotational entropy as compared to the bulk. But because of the presence of the protein and the constraints uh, thereof, uh, the, the translational um, degrees of freedom cannot be higher than that of the bulk. That's why the translational entropy is lower than bulk. Now, when we are talking about hydrogen bonds, um, we get something interesting if we look into the surface density of hydrogen bonds, uh, particularly with respect to the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic surfaces on the proteins. So um, on the left-hand side, again, we have the results for gamma crystalline, and on the right-hand side, we have the same for first LCD. The red lines, uh, uh, the lines are basically linear fits on the data. Uh, so the red uh, color, this denotes the hydrophobic surface density of protein water hydrogen bonds. And the blue line represents the hydrophilic surface density of protein water hydrogen bonds. And as you can see, the red line decreases. That is the hydrophobic surface density of hydrogen bonds decreases, which means that with increasing concentration, the hydrophobic surfaces on the protein are getting deweighted. The population of water molecules are decreasing on these surfaces. And these surfaces are actually interacting with each other. Uh, that is protein-protein interactions are increasing on these surfaces and the protein-water interaction, uh, interactions are decreasing. So these water molecules that are getting deweighted, uh, they are actually getting released into the bulk. On the other hand, we have the hydrophilic surfaces where with the increase in protein concentration, the number of hydrogen bonds or the density of hydrogen bonds increases. That is the population of water molecules on the hydrophilic surfaces increases. So these are the water molecules that are retained on formation of the protein condensates. So from this analysis, we can categorize water molecules into two separate parts. One are the released water molecules that are, that are released into the bulk on condensate formation, and the others are retained water molecules that are retained within these condensates. Now, the question is, can we actually uh, calculate the entropy contributions for these two different kinds of systems? Um, so for that, we will need two reference entropies. So the first reference will be the what for the water molecules that are released. So for that, obviously, the uh, reference entropy would be the bulk entropy. And how do we get that? We can simply simulate a box of neat water molecules without any proteins under similar conditions. And from there, we can calculate the entropy of the bulk liquid. On the other hand, uh, we, can we can get the reference entropy for the water molecules in the condensate by knowing the um, concentration of the proteins in the condensate. So how do we get that? So this is a phase diagram of gamma D crystalline. <clears throat> and if you look into the dome, like I explained, so when you, uh, so this dotted line is the coexistence line. And once you go from inside the dome to outside, you basically enter a condensate phase. So at the very point where you cross this line at a given temperature, this gives you the value of the 
concentration of uh, proteins in the condensate. Now, this dome over here was obtained by fitting it to an equation based on the uh, experimental values on the left-hand side only. But it was actually shown that this uh, um, dome is actually uh, not as symmetric as you would get from a fitting. So uh, in reality, there is a around 50, 45 to 50 mix per mil um, error limit uh, to this to this fitting. Uh, so for example, this is from another similar system, which is gamma-3 crystalline, which is bovine, not human crystalline. So uh, from the concentrations that we have from our simulations, we can actually uh, take this 420 milligram per mil concentration as the reference concentration, and we already have the entropy value that I have shown before. So, in principle, we can create an entropy bill for the released water molecules and the retained water molecules. Uh, so, for, and there's a tug of war between these two uh, categories of waters. So, for uh, again, we have the gamma crystalline results on left and the fast LCD results on right. And you can see that the red lines, which denote the uh, entropy change because of the water molecules released into the bulb, it has a positive energy contribution, which means it's favorable. On the other hand, the retained water molecules uh, experience a decrease in entropy, which is unfavorable. But what is important is the total contribution of the released and the retained water molecules. So if we sum them up, the total we see is actually positive which means that in both the cases, which means that the total, entropy uh, the total entropy contribution of water molecules is favorable towards the LLPS formation. But uh, the other piece of the puzzle uh, of uh, the total solvation free energy is of course enthalpy. Uh, and um, although entropy is the uh, main um, objective of this uh, research, but we cannot forget that enthalpy also plays a very important role. Enthalpy for like um, less compressible systems, we can just consider uh, the energy, the potential energy, the interaction energies. And um, here we, uh, we have two parts, of course, for solvation. One is the protein water energy and uh, the other is the water water interaction energy. And actually for solvent also, we have similar counterparts, but it was shown that the water water interaction energy is exactly balanced out by the water water solvent contribution. So which means that we are, for the total solvation free energy, we are left with only the pro protein water interaction terms. And if we calculate the protein water interaction terms, and of course here, since we have several proteins in the system, so protein protein interaction terms also become important. So uh, here, um, sorry, I forgot to mention that again, on the left-hand side, we have gamma crystalline and on the right-hand side, we have fast LCD. I forgot to mention the names here. Uh, anyway, uh, the red line denotes the protein-protein interaction energy per protein molecule, and the blue line um, indicates uh, the same for protein-water interaction energies. And as you can see, with increasing concentration, the protein-protein interaction energy decreases, which, which means that it becomes more favorable, whereas the protein-water interaction energy increases. So it becomes less favorable. And this is the same case for uh, fast LCD. <clears throat> So um, to sum it all up, we see that first in terms of entropy, there is a tug of war uh, kind of relation between the water molecules that are released into the bulk and the ones that are retained into the protein condensates. And if we take the total entropy contribution from these two water molecules, these two categories of water molecules, we see that the change in entropy because of water is favorable towards LLPS. On the other hand, uh, protein. Uh, when we talk about enthalpy or interaction energy, the protein-protein interaction energies are favorable for this process, whereas the protein-water interaction energies are not so favorable. So uh, with this, I, uh, I would like to acknowledge my um, postdoc guide, Professor Lars Schaeffer, and my coworker, uh, Mr. Tobias Pras. Um, this is the molecular simulation group. Um, virtual zoom, not a photo really, but uh, uh, print screen. Uh, I would also like to thank the uh, Theoretical Chemistry Center at RUB for computational facilities and Resolve and DFG for um, uh, the funding. And thank you all for joining today. And I'm open to questions.
Okay, thank you, Samyak, very much for the presentation. And then we now move to the, the section for questions and discussion. I remind you, you can simply post your interest to ask a question and then we give you uh, the mic to, to, to ask it directly. So we have a first question by Giancarlo Francese. So Giancarlo, please, you can ask the question. Okay, thank you, thank you. So nice talk. And um, my question is about the concentration that you use for your condensates. Are those values uh, relevant in biological systems? Because usually those are the one considered in the in vitro uh, experiments, right? But those are much higher than, than the one in biological condensates, in cellular condensates. So mm -hmm. did you consider that case? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so we are, um, for preparing our systems, we have not really uh, considered the biological concentration as such, but we have followed the phase diagram uh, and also uh, the experiments that are performed so that we can um, compare our results to experimental values. Yes, uh, the concentrations that you would find in cells are much lower than what we have. Uh, that is also, and also, um, the higher concentrations that we have are not always accessible to experiments. That is why, for example, I showed uh, in one of the phase diagrams, you have only the left uh, region uh, of the phase diagram, not the right one that's fitted. So um, we have not explicitly uh, taken, the, uh, taken into consideration the biological concentrations, but uh, the ones that are um, done in experiments. Okay, may, may I uh, just add another short yeah. question yeah. to that? Yes, it, it, when you show the balance of the entropy terms in, mm -hmm. in both cases that mm -hmm. you studied, you were showing that uh, at least in one of the two cases, the balance was going towards zero when the concentration mm -hmm. decreases. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and in, in, in the other case was almost not depending on the concentration. So yeah. how do you interpret that? Yes, um, that's, a, that's an excellent question, actually. Um, so uh, first thing we have to remember is that the concentration range for uh, studied, uh, these are two differently uh, different kinds of proteins. Uh, so the concentration ranges are not um, exactly in alignment with each other, but so uh, for the uh, low concentration protein solutions, uh, if a condensate forms at that concentration, the water molecules released into the bulk because it is towards uh, the left of the phase diagram, which means that the water molecules released to the bulk will, will be lesser than the water molecules that are um, constrained into the um, uh, into the condensate itself, which means that the contribution of the released water molecules will be lower than the ones which are retained into the condensate. So obviously, uh, for the retention, the entropy decreases. So it is expected that if we are actually moving towards the left uh, branch of the phase diagram, that is towards lower concentrations, the total entropy contribution will be zero. So uh, what your question uh, and this observation actually tells us that the entropy contribution of water will be important only after a certain con concentration of proteins, not before that. Okay, and uh, and uh, like for the gamma crystalline, we don't have that because we do not have uh, simulation results at lower concentrations, uh, concentrations which we are actually doing. Uh, currently, we are simulating a system with 50 mix per mil protein solution. And we expect that we will see a similar kind of decrease uh, actually uh, to a negative value uh, beyond that concentration. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So there is uh, now a question by Lipika. Uh, hi, hi, nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my question is how did you create the initial system? Like you said that you didn't take the like the usual way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you? Okay, uh, so, um, so uh, uh, the creation of the initial system for gamma crystalline, we have the PDB files, so 1HKO. So the uh, first we simulated uh, the system uh, at a lower concentration with a lot of water molecules. And then in steps, we decreased the number of water molecules and uh, we did NPT simulations so that the density is equilibrated. In that way, keep, uh, when we keep on decreasing the water molecules in the system, the concentration of the protein increases. So that is how we get the concentration of the uh, the concentrations that we desire. And for the first LCD, uh, since it does not have any uh, 
proper crystal structure. We took the initial uh, coordinates from uh, from AlphaFold, which is an AI uh, that um, that uh, that gives you a structure based on your amino acid sequence. Uh, but then we actually simulated it for uh, over microseconds in first in coarse grained simulations to get uh, these spaghetti like structures. And then we back mapped it, them to all atom uh, coordinates, all atom uh, description, and then again equilibrated uh, in the similar way, uh, like I just mentioned, like keep keeping on decreasing water molecules to get the desired concentration. Okay, so the basically at the when you are analyzing, there is a dense phase and the dilute phase of the protein in your system. Uh, not really, because uh, once we uh, once we have a certain concentration that we need by decreasing water molecules, we actually do uh, uh, an NPT simulation of that so that the total box or the total concentration of proteins is homogeneous because we are doing an NPT simulation and it's equilibrating to a specific density of water and of the system. So in a single system, we have only one concentration, like homogeneous, not a uh, coexistence phase. Okay, okay. So you are only focusing of on the like not the dilute phase on the yes like, yes, yes yes yeah yeah okay. And in another uh, just simple question like that in the uh, total re entropy where the, you showed the retained and the other one, mm -hmm. so the total entropy for the foods in the low uh, protein concentration was negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In one of the point. So yeah. at that protein concentration, is it like going to the phase separated state? Um, uh, so uh, there are two terms, two important terms, the enthalpy and entropy. So at that point from our simulation, we see that um, the entropy is lower than zero, that is it's negative. But then the enthalpy term also becomes important because we saw that the protein-protein interaction also gives a favorable uh, thermodynamic driving force. Since from our simulations, we do not really see a phase separation as such, the whole process, so it will be difficult to say whether at that point the, um, the system actually phase separates. But one thing is for sure that even if it does, water molecule, the entropy of water molecule will, will not have a contribution to that because it's uh, negative, the total change. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, okay. I got thank it. You. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And there was a question by Lorenzo Petroli, but he says that basically that was the question that uh, Lipika asked. So unless Lorenzo wants to add anything, uh, uh, no, no, thanks. It was pretty similar. Okay, so we can move then to the next question. That's by Marcus De Sarno. So, Marcus. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I believe you mentioned in your talk that you can measure like water's orientation entropy because you have access to the uh, rotation velocities. And I thought it was a little bit confusing because I thought if I want to measure the orientation entropy, I do this by the orientation distribution functions, such as the angles. Am I missing something here or did I just misunderstand you? So what you're talking about are the orientation of water molecules. For example, um, you can talk about tetrahedral uh, entropy like um, that was in, uh, introduced by Kumar and Stanley. Uh, but that is a bit different from here. Um, so what we are talking about is not uh, orientation as such, but the rotation of water molecules. So if you talk about the rotational degrees of freedom of a molecule, the entropy that you would derive out of that, uh, that's what we are talking about. And if you are talking about orientation, that involves uh, like two body or three body terms, right? So uh, does that make it clear? Well, when I think about orientation entropy in the context of, let's say, liquid crystals or something like this, mm -hmm, I, I mm -hmm. do this by measuring probability distributions okay. of like the directions in which the mesogens are pointing, but I don't have to know their speeds of rotation to do so. Yeah, I mean, um, th that's true. But uh, the way 2PT deals with entropy is it gets the spectral density from velocity autocorrelation. So to get the rotational entropy, we need the rotational uh, density of states. And we can actually uh, use that to get the rotational entropy. So like uh, that's how the method uh, works. So um, the orientation or, for example, the uh, tetrahedral order of water, uh, for example, um, does not uh, explicitly come into the theory uh, as such. Oh, okay, thank. I, I need to think about this. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. Thank probably you. calls for a follow-up discussion. Yes, the, yes. Uh, part. So I don't see any additional question. So I think we, we had already quite a nice discussion. So <clears throat> let me then 
just uh, close this first part of uh, today's uh, event by thanking you for joining to this uh, 16th installment of the mid gen series i hope you found the presentations interesting and i remind you that if you have registered now you can you have received an email with a link that allows you to enter into the gathered town uh, where then we have the posters so posters of this present these two presentations plus additional posters by other attendees and where then you can uh, discuss and uh, informally and as i said previous sessions are available on our website and on our sicam uh, uh, channel uh, in youtube and then if you you can follow us on twitter to keep up with the latest news so thank you very much and i hope to see you in in next uh, mixed gen events mm -hmm.